About 10 months ago, my wife and I had our first child. And something I've noticed is that it takes a long time for my son to understand that one thing leads to another. Because the world is so new to him, he'll be so engrossed with one thing and then the next without comprehending that there's a direct connection between them. One thing I've often tried to do is point at things to direct his gaze, but the problem is that when I stick my hand out, he pays attention to my hand. The only way I can get him to look at what I'm pointing to is to try to get my finger as close to the object of interest as possible, because he doesn't yet understand that the function of a pointed finger is not to draw attention to itself, but to invite you to look at something else. There is, of course, innocence in the fact that he's content to focus on my hand, but the hope is that he'll soon grow to see that when I point things out to him, I'm not showing off my hand. I'm beckoning him to pay attention to something that he might otherwise miss. I believe stories function in a similar way. While they may be beautiful or at least interesting in and of themselves, ultimately they point us to something else. They beckon us, the viewer or the reader, to pay attention to something that we might otherwise miss. If you were lost in the wilderness and you met with a stranger, you'd probably hope they could point you to the right path or at least give you a general direction to go in. Good stories have the power to do this, to shake us out of our often monotonous or even frantic search for meaning and suggest that maybe we're moving in the wrong direction entirely. And I'm not talking about heavy-handed, moralistic stories that condescend to and preach at the audience, but more so the types of stories that earnestly invite people to look at something good, true, or beautiful. Often as consumers of stories, especially movies and TV shows, we're tempted to get so enamored with the outer layer, you know, the actors who are involved, the special effects, the tie-ins with other media that we consume, or the flashy cinematography. It seems like there's an unofficial competition to see who can film the coolest single take fight scene. And there's nothing wrong with that. I often work as a cinematographer myself and understand that there's a thrill in pushing your craft to the limits. But the danger lies in limiting what our stories are capable of, in relegating art and cinema to mere entertainment, eye candy, or wish fulfillment where we get so excited that the studios listened to the fans and gave us exactly what we asked for. How strange would it be if that guide in the wilderness pointed me to the nearest town, but like my son, all I did was stare at his pointed finger, maybe criticize his bone structure and ill-kept cuticles, before just going on my way further into exile. Or on the other hand, what if I was being pointed in what I knew was the wrong direction, but because of the stranger's fair appearance, I followed his advice blindly? Whether we admit it or not, we're all looking for some central truth. We're all looking for that fulcrum by which the world turns. Even during our bouts of cynicism where we deny the existence or the importance of that truth, seldom do we really feel neutral. I think we always have a sense that we're either moving towards or away from the center of reality. And the world of stories can help us get there because stories breathe life into abstractions that we couldn't otherwise comprehend. They take ethereal ideas and give them feet. John chapter 1 verse 14 says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. The immaterial Word was made material. This is of course referring to the Incarnation or God taking on flesh in the person of Christ, but there's an echo of that in the stories we tell. For good or ill, they reflect who we are and give bodies to our highest loves or deepest fears. Because of this, stories can make wonderful guides through the labyrinth surrounding the essential truth. And beginning our journey to the center largely depends on where we are on the map, what direction we're going, and how we respond to those we meet along the way. If I'm starting on the edge of the map, moving in the wrong direction, I don't need detailed advice that I'm going to forget. All I need is someone to point me the other way. And as I get closer to what I'm searching for, the pointing can get more and more specific. There's more that could be drawn out of this analogy. How do you know which stories to trust along the way? Is it possible that a good story might not point in the exact right direction, but rather point out a pitfall and caution you against losing yourself there? These are questions that I hope to explore in future videos. Viewing stories as guides along the road to truth is only one method of interpretation, but one that I think is helpful in a world where we are constantly inundated with stories. 
where are they pointing us? Are they helping or hindering us in our journey to truth and meaning? What stories are we telling that others can see? What story are you living 